I want to start out by telling a story that it's not a real story. I made it up, <laughs> but I think it outlines the different ways that we may have been raised. And I just want to share this story as a recap of where we've been going because to live in freedom, to live healed and fully alive, we're going to all have to go on our unique story. We have to look at our own unique story, what we've been through, and allow the healing love and light of the Lord to enter our particular story. So think about where you are at in, um, oh, um, here I'm going to uh, see if there's, uh, I'm going to, oh, I can hit mute all. I didn't know I could mute all. Um, I'm going to hit mute all. So we don't, yeah. okay. Can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, okay. Okay. So I want you to think of where, how you grew up, maybe the childhood that you experienced. So here's the story. Imagine four children. The first child, while kneeling on the couch with his arms resting on the windowsill, sees kids playing outside and is eager to join them. He runs to the front door, but his parents stand in the way and say, no, there is danger out there. The first child is not free to go outside because he learned from his parents that the world is dangerous and possibly bad. The child now lives in fear and doesn't want to ever go outside. He is imprisoned. The second child grew up in a home where his parents never taught him about the outside world. He was supposed to figure it out on his own. Every day, due to his curiosity, the second child would rush out the door and explore all that the outside world had to offer. The second child did not have his free will taken from him like the first child. Instead, he was raised with no guidance on how one ought to live, nor knowledge of what was morally good or bad. His parents were never around and did not have much interest in the child's life. The child used his free will to go down a path that no child should ever experience, and he began to see life as a burden and curse. The resulting bad experiences led the child to hiding in his room, locking the door behind him, and never wanting to go outside again. Therefore, the second child was also imprisoned. The third child grew up with helicopter parents. They took the child outside, but treated him like a dog on a collar. When the child wanted to explore in a direction that could possibly harm him mentally, physically, or emotionally, the parents yanked the child, choking him in a sense. This child did not taste danger, but his taste of the good wasn't very enjoyable because the good was forced upon him and shoved down his throat without his own free will to choose it. The only time the child's leash was off when, when he was in his crate, his home, with the door locked. This child is chained to the good because he didn't freely choose the good for himself. So one day, he began to rebel and choose the bad out of bitterness and resentment. Finally, the fourth child. The parents did not squash the child's free will to choose good or bad, but wisely instructed him about what is outside. They taught the child that the outside world is very good, but also cautioned him that some abuse its goodness, creating danger. When the child went outside, he wasn't afraid or scrupulous walking on eggshells, but played joyfully. He played out of a secure identity because knowing he was loved and could trust that his parents' education about life was for his good. Yes, the parents knew the child would get hurt and at times would run in crying with a bloody knee, but the child knew his parents would embrace him whenever he fell or was in pain. His parents would then encourage him to get up, to not be afraid, because the good is worth fighting for. 
we can all sense that final child had more of a better upbringing. Where were you in this story, perhaps? You know, I can think of my own journey. And a lot of times I was like the fourth child where I was raised with amazing parents. But at times it may have felt like the good was shoved a little bit. Like I had to just follow these rules and these laws. And if I don't, then I won't be loved or I won't be accepted by my parents. And at times it was legalistic. Why I share this is because our, our environment, how we are raised, our woundedness, just recapping, will affect our beliefs. It may make us believe lies about ourselves and lies about who God is and what the world is all about and friends. Our environment, our wounds affect our beliefs, make us believe lies. The lies then change our feelings, negative feelings and emotions. And those negative feelings and emotions make us behave and act in ways we shouldn't behave and act. I'm going to say it one more time to just kind of recap the, sec the sessions before. Our wounds make us believe lies about ourselves through the evil one. That changes. So our wounds affect our beliefs. Our beliefs, beliefs affect our feelings. And our feelings and emotions affect how we behave and it becomes a cycle and a reoccurring cycle and a reoccurring cycle. And Christ comes in and he wants to redeem our story, rewrite our story so that we can live healed and ultimately in freedom. And I, I share this because it's so important. It makes us see ourselves and others differently. So often we sin, we misbehave and we're, we beat ourselves up. Oh, look what you've done. Why do you keep doing the same thing? Or we look at others and just like, whoa, that person's impatient. Whoa, that person's a sinner. We look at their actions and judge them rather than having a curiosity and a wonder about where those actions might be coming from because it comes from a certain story that is one of wounds or pain. And I remember one time I was having lunch with Christopher West, who I mention a lot. He's been my mentor. And I was sitting down having lunch and there was a guy on the other, other side of the restaurant and Christopher said, see that guy over there? And I kind of look over and he's like, Brendan, if you knew that man's story, you would utterly weep. If you truly knew his story, what he has been through, you would utterly weep. This is Lord, open our eyes open our eyes. I want to see. I want to see others as you see others, but also help me to see myself, Lord, how you see me. Because he doesn't focus on the sin. He focuses on the pain that is in our hearts. So we need to be like detectives and look at our misbehavior, look at our feelings, look at our lies we are believing as clues to find the source. Only when we can find the source can we really allow truth and love in there to where we can truly be healed and ultimately be free? So I wanna share that kind of as a recap. The truth is what sets us free, All right? That's what Christ says, the truth is what sets us free. So maybe through these sessions, I know some of us might be joining us for the first time, but maybe through these sessions, you've reflected on your story. And what we have to do now is bring that into the light, into truth himself, all of our woundedness, our story into the light and allow truth to speak into those places. Pope Benedict says this. I love this. He says, before Jesus's gaze. So when we go to prayer, when we enter into meditation with Christ, we allow Jesus, who is truth, to gaze at us. Before Jesus's gaze, all falsehood melts away. Before his gaze, all falsehood melts away. This encounter with him, as it burns us, transforms and frees us, allowing us to become truly ourselves. His gaze, the touch of his heart, heals us through an undeniably painful transformation as through fire. 
but it is a blessed pain in which the holy power of his love sears through us like a flame, enabling us to become totally ourselves and totally of God. Freedom is to abide in the depths of our hearts in what is true and what is good. Heaven is perfect freedom. It's when the human person reaches the fullness that is perfect freedom. And I once heard it say that purgatory is the perfect love of God coming into the dark places of our hearts that we believe lies about ourselves. And we have to let go of those lies and allow truth in. And at times, because we're so comfortable with those lies in our heart, because they've just been our whole story, we're so comfortable that to let those things go and allow truth in is painful. The fire of his love is painful, but as it sears through us, as it sears through those lies, and we begin to be grounded in that truth as beloved, as good, then we become more and more free and we enter more into union with God, which is the freedom we're made for. So I wanna take a pause right here and we're gonna do some prayer together. All right, I'm, we're gonna do some prayer together. We're gonna to do it for a couple minutes. So I wanna just invite you to close your eyes. So I want you to close your eyes and just take a couple deep breaths. And just under your breath, say, come Holy Spirit. And I want you to repeat after me. In the name of Jesus Christ, I renounce the lie that I am unlovable. And in Jesus' name, I announce the truth that I am loved, that I am good, that I am wanted. In Jesus' name, I renounce the lie that no one sees me, that I am all alone. And in Jesus' name, I announce the truth that God will never leave me. That God sees me. In the name of Jesus Christ, I renounce the lie that I am ugly, stupid, perverted, worthless. And in Jesus' name, I announce the truth that I am washed, cleansed, justified. Come Holy Spirit, pour your truth into our hearts, pour your truth into our minds. In Jesus' name, amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. I just want you to pay attention to your heart. Um, because oftentimes when we speak those lies, when we speak it and we say it, it touches on places of our hearts. And we just wanna be attentive of our hearts. You know, at times it, I often say, you could be driving down the road, you could be at work, pay attention to the lies of your hearts and you can renounce them right then and there. I renounce the lie that I feel like I'm not seen. And I announce the truth that I am seen. Right, we have to be grounded in this identity and that's, the, that's when we get more and more free. So the world holds out that freedom is indifferent. You know, be free, do whatever you want, make choices, no choice is really better than the other, or if it is better, it's just relative based off of a person. But the Catechism of the Catholic Church says freedom begins with free will, but is a force of growth and maturity and truth and goodness. 
it attains its perfection when directed toward God, our beatitude. So we become more and more free when we choose what is good, when we do what is right. Not freedom of indifference, but freedom of excellence. It's always asking the question, what is the right choice to make? Even if it might hurt me in this moment, maybe it won't feel good, but what is the right choice in this moment? This is the growth of virtue and it perfects us and ultimately leads to our beatitude. So Christ comes after our heart in order for us to make these right choices. It's the transformation of our heart. So I want to describe four people, not the four children that I, I shared in the beginning. It's a different story. But this kind of describes the perfection we're made for through choosing the good and abiding in the good and the truth, but also how the opposite, where it can lead us to, by choosing what is evil or what is bad and actually abiding in that. So I want you to imagine you are at a grocery store, right? You're at the grocery store and to get into the front entrance, there is stairs that you have to go up the stairs, okay? So you go up the stairs and you start walking into the grocery store and you look back and you see this elderly woman struggling getting up the stairs, like struggling. And you're the only one near her and she's wobbling, she's almost falling, she seems like she's in pain. What the saint would do, what the person who is in tune with God's heart, who is fully alive and fully free, we might say, that person would rush over to the elderly lady and slowly walk her up the steps with delight and joy, okay? So it's doing the good positively. That's what we're all made for. You know, another way to look at it, this is a, a separate thing, but what would the saint do if they were typing in on their email and all of a sudden something popped up that was pornographic? The person's heart would be in tune with God's heart that they would be repulsed. They would feel saddened by the degradation. So they would close the laptop but their hearts would feel saddened. They would be in tune with the reality. So let's go back to grandma now, elderly grandma, all right? They would do the good positively, all right? Then we might have someone who's more like the Pharisee where they look back at elderly grandma and yeah, I should help her. And they go over and they do it, but they're drudging it. Oh, come on, grandma, they're thinking interiorly. Get up the steps, Ugh, fine. I don't want to do it, but I have to because it's good. Or they do it to maybe impress other people. So they're doing the good negatively, all right? So-so person. I've been there, maybe you've been there. Okay, now there's the person who doesn't go over to elderly grandma. They choose the bad, but they have a negative effect. So they look at grandma and they don't do anything. They go back into the store, but they're thinking in their conscience, in their hearts, in their attitudes, I probably should have. Ah. The last person is the person who does something bad, but they have a positive attitude about it. They don't go to help grandma, but their heart is in such a place that they laugh at it. They find delight and joy in the evil, in the bad. And this is when things can be really, really dark. This is when the prison of evil or of sin becomes home and and it becomes so home that it's like we somehow find comfort in it we somehow find joy in it we find joy of making fun of people the journey that christ is on is he's after the heart what he says to the pharisees is you know the law don't murder you know the law don't commit adultery you're following the law but that is not what's going to allow the law to be imprinted on your heart which allows you to be free. He says, even if you look at a woman with lust, even if you have anger in your heart. In other words, if we go back to wounds cause beliefs, beliefs cause feelings, feelings cause actions. He's saying, you know the actions that are bad, but I say to you, cleanse the inside of the cup so the outside might be clean. You have to go down to those feelings and emotions, to those beliefs, so that you can see the true value of the Creator's plan. 
So that is really the journey that we all need to go on. And that's the Beatitudes. Blessed are the pure of heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the meek. Another way to say blessed are you is happy are you. Happy are you that thirst for righteousness. So the, the interior journey is where we have to go on. And again, it's going to look differently for everyone because we, we might all have different types of, well, we all have a different story. We all have different behaviors, different lies that we might believe about ourselves. So that's the journey that we have to go on. But I do want to make it very, very clear. Freedom is not happy feelings. It's not just a feeling of, I feel light and I feel good. All right. Heaven will be the perfection of those feelings and they will feel great and probably it'll be very joyful. But freedom is to abide in the truth and the good. And this might mean unto death. I mean, if you know the movie Braveheart, and I know a lot of women are on this call and, and Braveheart speaks to men more so, but he asked the people, you know, what are you going to do with your freedom in the face of tyranny? Are you going to fight? And they're all like, no, I'm going to run. I'm going to die. And he's like, you might die later on in life, but I bet you'll regret not fighting now. And at the very end of the movie, he's laying down about to be killed and he yells out freedom and he ultimately dies. And he dies is because he, he stood up for what is true and what is good and what is right. I want to share and conclude one last heroic story about a woman who I think did the same. And it, again, it shows that freedom, being free, is to live in the true and the good, to do what is right. Her name is Chiara Corbella. And Chiara Corbella, who is now blessed, grew up in Italy. She actually um, just in the late 1900s. And Chiara was pregnant in her mid-20s. And they, her and her husband, Enrico, were just full of joy, were bringing new life into the world. And they got an ultrasound to see how Chiara's baby was doing. And the doctor was shocked and said, Chiara, I am so, so sorry, but your baby doesn't have a skull. Your baby doesn't have a skull and, and is not gonna live long after birth. I think you should abort the baby. And Chiara, some of her friends were saying, you should consider aborting the baby. And she said to all of them, my baby may not be fit for this life, but it's absolutely fit for the next. We are going to accompany our baby to the Father in heaven. The baby was born, baptized, passed away, and, and was accompanied to the Father in heaven. A few months later, Kiara's pregnant again with another baby. Ultrasound. Kiara, we're so sorry. This baby doesn't have a skull. Second baby, they didn't know why, why this was happening. You should consider abortion. Kiara said, no. My baby may not be fit for this life, but it's absolutely fit for the next. We are going to accompany our baby to the father. The child was born baptized, and was accompanied to the Father in heaven. Kiara is now 27, 28 years old. She's pregnant with another baby, a third baby. Ultrasound? Kiara, you have a healthy baby. In her pregnancy, though, Kiara became ill and sick, and she found out she had cancer. She had a tumor, and they said, Kiara, you need treatment right now. You need treatment right now. And she's like, well, what about my baby? What about my baby? Well, Kiara, your baby could be negatively affected. Very bad. We don't know. And Kiara said, I want to refuse treatment because I want to give birth to a healthy baby. Kiara gave birth, healthy baby. But Kiara found out that her cancer was terminal. And she went on this journey of struggle with wrestling in her heart. And Enrico was mad at God. And one day, the day before Chiara passed away, her and Enrico were in the chapel praying. And Enrico said, Chiara, I don't get it. I don't get it. God says that his yoke is easy and light. Is this cross you're going through? easy and light? Is it really sweet, as God says? And she looks over 
to Enrico and smiles. She says, yes, the cross is very sweet. And the next day she passed away peacefully. And her husband Enrico, to this day is alive, going around the world, telling about his wife's story, about a woman who was heroic, who was heroic, but she was free. She did something heroic. She gave her life. She sacrificed her life for what is good, what is true, what is beautiful. And that right there is freedom. And we have the choice every day to not make choices, but we have the responsibility to make every choice count. Every choice count. And the more we do what is heroic in the small acts for one day, for a week, for a month, for a year, for five years, for 10 years, we will look back and we will see the transformation that God has done. It's just one step at a time. And we got to be patient with our own journey. With our own journey. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.